Hello, and welcome to the Bomb Squad Podcast. I am your host, Tim M. Sullivan, and with me I have... Hi, I'm Austin Zwiebelman. Hello, I'm Ethan Hawker. Before I introduce the film that we're talking about today, I have an announcement that I would like to make. This will be the final performance of the Bomb Squad Podcast. What? Uh, going forward, we're, we're going to be... Uh, Moving on to some bigger and uh, better things. We hope that uh, you will continue to stay tuned in as we move on to these bigger and better things. Ah, So, um, uh, we we hope that you will stick with us as we uh, move on. Does this mean I get a real VTuber avatar and not stuck with the stupid still image? For today, we hope that you will uh, stick with us as we talk about our film. Uh, which is Perfect Blue, the debut feature by Satoshi Kon. So, uh, Satoshi Kon, he started his career in film and animation as an assistant to Katsuhiro Otomo of Akira fame. He kind of started by working as a background designer on Rojin Z and uh, writing on uh, his film World Apartment Horror and uh, the Magnetic Rose segment of Memories, which uh, we talked about. That was one of the very first films that we discussed on the podcast. Perfect Blue was the first feature that he directed, but before that, he actually directed the last three episodes of the 1993 JoJo's Bizarre Adventure OVA. Basically, uh, the stuff where they were fighting Dio, he, that's what he directed. And this film is based on the novel Perfect Blue Complete Metamorphosis by the author Yoshikazu Takeuchi. I have not read the book. I've been made to understand it's a pretty loose adaptation of the novel. But yeah, he, he directed four films, uh, this one and uh, Millennium Actress, Tokyo Godfathers and uh, Paprika. And he created the television anime Paranoia Agent, which is basically a compilation of several ideas that he had that he wanted to make as movies, but couldn't quite fully flesh out. So he instead decided to just make them as half hour TV episodes. His films were, of course, very influential on many Hollywood directors, uh, which uh, this is the part where we address the Aronofsky in the room. A lot of people tend to say that he bought the rights to adapt Perfect Blue so that he could put that scene in Requiem for a Dream. But what actually happened was he wanted to make a live action Perfect Blue but uh, for various reasons, he was not able to do that, but he recreated the scene in Requiem for a Dream as an homage, which uh, Cohn did not take kindly to. He was just kind of like, yeah, I guess I should just take stuff from other people and call it an homage. And then, of course, he went on to make Black Swan, which is basically a Hollywood adaptation of Perfect Blue, as much as he denies that that was what he was going for. That's what it is. And then, of course, Nolan made Inception, which is strikingly similar to Cohn's final film, Paprika. He began working on a fifth film called Dream Machine, but he was unable to complete it after falling ill with pancreatic cancer and uh, passed away in 2010 with only 600 of his 1500 planned shots for the film having been animated. But yeah, I mean, he was a very prolific anime director, having only directed four films and one TV show, and yet we're still talking about him 12 years after his death. So uh, my first question is, uh, what do you think makes Satoshi Kon stand out as an anime director? We will start with Austin. So I guess you could say that this guy is impressive 
at the outset for being one of those directors whose movies had certain cool, original ideas years before they were repackaged for the United States of McDonald's over here. Now, it's been a while since I was in college and did my deep dive on Cone's features, a process that would only take 350 minutes to do because f pancreatic cancer, I guess. From what I can remember, Satoshi Kone movies are just absurdly good from a visual standpoint. That's the most superficial thing that stands out to people like me who aren't as versed in anime. Everything's rendered in this somewhat realistic style, so when something surreal happens, it shines better than, say, like, visual effects in a live-action feature often do. He did this short lifetime kind of sampler of impressive creative exercises. Like Tokyo Godfathers, Millennium Actress, those movies have so much heart. Perfect Blue and Paranoia Agent are these attention-grabbing sort of commentaries on complicated things that happen in modern day society. And Paprika's just f***ing nuts. Uh, just pure movie magic. He's like the John Cazeal of anime directors. Remember John Cazeal? He walked in, did nothing but masterpieces, and then went straight to heaven? Yeah, it's one of those. He was just like an actual visionary. That's the only way to explain what he accomplished. Uh, before I hop off, I just want to say, I know his other movies get a lot more attention, but Millennium Actress is a movie that made me cry harder than almost anything I've ever seen. All of his movies are special, but that one in particular really gets to me. Hell yeah. Yeah, Millennium Actress is uh, great, uh, but Ethan, uh, what, what do you think uh, makes Kon stand out as a director? Well, when I think of Satoshi Kon, I think of elf girls that love pudding. Just love it. Ah. Uh, because of his animation work on the classic OVA series, Deta Toko Princess, the second episode. Everything else, disappointing. Garbage. No. Hate it. Oh, f I can't believe you've done this. That gentleman sure doesn't cut you any slack, does he? He lives to give me grief. No, I'm kidding. I love all of uh, Cohn's work. What I think of, um, makes it stand out from a lot of other directors, it has a very cinematic style. If anything, Perfect Blue seems to be in the tradition of work like Ghost in the Shell, uh, visually, in terms of direction. But it makes sense considering Ghost in the Shell's own visual style is, you know, heavily derived from uh, Mamoru Oshii's uh, Pet Labor 2, which, of course, Cohn did layouts for. Um, that sort of sterile quality, the u heavy use of, like, fisheye perspective. It employs a very cinematic sort of language that is even atypical for like other anime directors of the day. I think dreams factor so heavily into his films, and part of that is you know his love of cinema and that sort of thing. But um, more than anything, I feel like it's him sort of cribbing from you know his maybe key inspiration, which which is Katsuhiro Otomo. He was an assistant to Otomo for so long, but um, his own visual style, his own illustration style early on in his career is basically just that of Otomo's, with maybe a little bit more of like the traditional Gekiga sort of style that you might see a little bit of like Ikigami, Ryoichi Ikigami seeping in. I think that Millennium Actress, as much as I love it, kind of has him very much framed as like somebody who's almost exclusively interested in cinema outside of, you know, like manga and that sort of thing, which is not great because he, he wrote a lot of manga for, you know, a decade and a half um, before he directed any movie. And a lot of that theming crops up in his filmography. A lot of, you know, youths and a lot of dream logic and that sort of thing. He really hones in on that, and I, I kind of love that, um, because Mamoru Oshii, probably his, mo you know, the closest comparable contemporary to him, is a director who had that for a little bit, you know, literally, you know, Beautiful Dreamer, his breakout movie, it has dreams right in the title, but he didn't really run with it. He sort of gets distracted by technology as time goes on, uh, get a, bit of a bit of a George Lucas thing going on there, <laughs> as much as, you know, his literal fixation on technology as a thematic element. And you see a little bit of that in Perfect Blue, but I'm glad he was able to get away from it and make a lot of films, each of which, um, despite like similar visual motifs and similar designs, are so distinct and different from one another. <laughs> I think he's really incredible and his loss is just tremendous. One of the true visionaries of anime that we lost, but I'm glad we at least were able to get these fantastic films and uh, Paranoia Agent from him before he left us. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think that like having worked with Otomo on so many things and then uh, working with uh, Mamoru Oshii on uh, the Pat Labor movie definitely kind of helped influence his visual style while kind of coming into his own directorially on his works. Yeah, every day is just one big dream. Our world is happy and Something that makes Cone stand out a lot among anime directors is that he He's not really an anime fan. Like, he's very critical of otaku culture in general. Like, it kind of reminds me of a couple years ago, the Toonami Preflight podcast had done an interview with uh, the producer Maki Terushima Furuta, who uh, is a producer for Production IG. And she was talking about how when she went in for the interview for that job, she was not a fan of anime at all. She fell asleep trying to watch Ghosts in the Shell before going to the interview. <laughs> and uh, she didn't have good answers for any of the questions they asked. And uh, at the end of the interview, they were just like, would you say you love anime or hate it? And she just goes, hate it. And they go, all right, you got the job. Uh, <laughs> Because, like, they didn't want a yes man. They wanted somebody who would be able to look at each project objectively and make it a good product. And I think that's kind of what makes Cone's work great is that he's not trying to necessarily make something that appeals to anime fans. He's just trying to make a good movie. And he very much succeeded. Like, all four of his movies. A lot of people say, like, this one's my favorite movie. This one's my favorite movie. Uh, Perfect Blue, Millennium Actress, Tokyo Godfathers, Paprika. And any of those is the correct answer. They're all extremely good films. Any ranking you make of those films, you're correct. They're just all so good. They are all trying to say different things and accomplish different moods, and they all succeed really well at that, which I think is more than you can say about most directors anywhere in any field of movies or animation. What he was able to do in four films and one TV show is just so remarkable. Like, I think that he had to die early because God saw that he was too powerful. He could not be allowed to continue making these incredible movies. He had to be stopped. Again, just so very glad that he was able to give us all of these great films that he gave us before he passed. And of course, um, Paranoia Agent, which is an incredible series with what I believe to be the greatest opening of any anime ever. It's just people laughing as Susumu Hirosawa goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. It's the kind of thing that when you see that at 2 a.m. on Adult Swim as a 13 year old, it shapes your mind and turns you into who you will become as a person. But back on to the main point, what do you think of Perfect Blue, his uh, first film? We'll start with Austin. <laughs> It's so wild watching this movie from 1997, back when the internet didn't even have Google yet, let alone social media. And this movie still accurately depicts how much of an accelerant the internet was for particularly stalkers. This movie never lets you go two minutes without some kind of big red flag going up. Five minutes in, you get this shot that, by the way, would have looked terrible in live action. You couldn't do it outside of animation, where Me Mania, the villain, has Mima dancing in the palm of his hand like some kind of f***ing doll. And the lyrics, oh my god, the lyrics in that opening performance. That song is catchy, I gotta admit, but it really hammers home how musicians, particularly women doing pop music, could have their dumb bubblegum lyrics turned into fuel for psychos. This is a great example of how you use 80 minutes. It has the kind of pacing most people could only maintain in short films. When she first gets that evil fax message and the fax machine's printing sound becomes a reoccurring part of the soundtrack, like this diegetic introduction of industrial sounding horror music, all oh, that shit rocks! <laughs> And it was 
Kind of biting how they lampoon Japanese TV from the era. Up to the first time you hear an actress read her lines on set, you're treated to some very basic, relatable, like, slice of life stuff revolving around Mima, with occasional hints at, like, sad but very normal violence. Then there's this actress on set who's suddenly, you know, talking about a killer who rips people's skin off, and you're just like, good heavens! TV was a lion's den. And then they play with that stylistically in a way that's very clever for 97, um, at least with the limited range of films I've seen. There's always that looming implication that anytime horror movie stuff happens, that it could be part of the TV show, uh, the meme is on, or, or just a dream. Either way, it's so satisfying in a sensory way, when after the sort of final confrontation between Mima and Rumi, the camera just pans out to the f***ing city around them. You get so many sequences where insane shit happens, and Mima wakes up in her bed or something. You get drawn in and just kind of surrender. You're like, okay, I guess we may not know what's real or fake anymore. Whoops. So then when the camera finally hangs on the city, you know, that was real. That's a wrap. The nightmare's over. I had such a good time rewatching this and appreciating the risks it took with its style and its storytelling. The soundtrack really gets me pumped, and some of the, these images really struck a chord with me emotionally. Big shout out to the scene where Rumi's gonna let herself get hit by a truck because she thinks the truck's headlights are actually a spotlight coming up over a crowd of her adoring fans. This movie is not for the faint of heart, but if you can handle the sheer ugliness that it depicts, it's a f***ing classic. Hell yeah. Watching it this time and seeing that uh, fax machine thing, like, I know celebrities constantly will get, like, hate mail and death threats, but there's just something oddly just extremely invasive about somebody sending you a hate fax. They wasted your paper and ink on that <laughs> and made you see it in your house. Only the Church of Scientology <laughs> deserves such, such madness. Yeah, and something about getting like a physical message to like yeah. if it's an email or something, that's one thing. Like that's scary in and of itself, but getting like a physical print that just reads yeah. like kill you or whatever. Like Like maybe an anthrax message is probably worse, but Or a bomb letter. Yeah, that too. But there's just something oddly just evil about that fax. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Ethan, uh, thoughts on the movie? Movie, good. Uh, Hell yeah! <laughs> love it. It's perfect. It's blue. What more do you want? Uh, no, I, I love it. Um, it's probably my favorite of Cohn's works, um, just in terms of like a pure watchability. Like I feel like maybe Millennium Actress is a bit happier um, um, in its way. I, I love it a lot too. Um, I, again, it's kind of one of those things where it, they're so different. It really depends upon your mood. The only similarity is the female leads all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it's a star system. Yeah, exactly. He's uh, he he likes Astro Boy by all accounts. So that makes sense. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. I think Perfect Blue is uh, great, um, sort of as a commentary on post-bubble Japanese culture, especially um, with the burst of the economic bubble in the early 90s and the rise of otaku culture proper. Like it had been bubbling under the surface in the 90s um, and then, you know, Gainax sort of finally hits it big with Evangelion and suddenly there's an explosion of anime, of, of V cinema, direct -to video a bunch of... As much as anything, I feel like Me Mania is a commentary on not just like disaffected weirdos, but like disaffected weirdos that are a product of a thoroughly busted culture where the only pe thing people have to hold on to is sort of pop culture ephemera. <laughs> The United States has been ex experiencing this, just lagging behind a little as well. But beyond like the socio-political context of it, it's just a rare treat in anime. It's rare that, um, particularly in like the realm of uh, feature film, you get what is just a tightly wound thriller like this without any sort of magical implications, any you know robots or cyborgs. Like like Pat Labor is a great political thriller, but it comes with the caveat of they have giant robots they need to sell you. Whereas <laughs> as Perfect Blue sort of starting it life as an original video animation, which I, is partially, I wonder if those sort of sal more salacious scenes, um, while Cohn is good at spinning them into commentary after the fact, I, I do wonder if those were initially like, we need to sell the OVA kind of thing, because even, even the best have those. He even said um, in his lecture series on Perfect Blue that like he developed that idea when it was in the OVA stages because like he wanted to put something more extreme in it, and then 
then when he watched it on the big screen, he was just like, oh, God. <laughs> he, he literally had that George Lucas moment of, I think I went too far in some places. <laughs> I, I think it, it can be very rough, but I feel like it's also very good at pointing out the artifice of the situation. I love the juxtaposition um, between, like, the actors, like, when, when the camera's rolling and then when it's not, and they're like, oh, sorry, let me move here. Are you comfortable? Everything okay? Um, like, I feel like that adds a safety to it in, like, a loose sense, but it also kind of persistent with the larger theme when we're not sure when what we're seeing is imagined, when what we're seeing is narrative, when what we're seeing is reality. It does make it a little disconcerting all the same, being able to see those lines being crossed and mixed. Um, it's just really so effective um, in creating this general sense of unease, which is effective in what is ostensibly a horror film, you know, a thriller, uh, if you want to make it more marketable to highbrow folks. But I feel like it's really good and a rare sort of high cinematic piece of media that has a lot of cool and good things to say about otaku culture. It's a good antidote um, to a lot of contemporary stuff that I, I like, but all the same, it's nice to have something that sort of says sometimes it's good to step away and you know, like <laughs> dial things back a little bit, be culturally conscious of what you're engaging in um, on top of just being a really good film in and of its own right. Nice. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Both solid points. For starters, I think I want to uh, kind of compare this to another film we talked about recently, uh, Nope, because Nope was a movie that was very much an allegory for exploitation in the entertainment industry. Like uh, you have characters like Gordy and Jean Jacket, who are these victims of the exploitation, who are fighting against the exploitation and you know you have the exploiters you got uh, the directors the cinematographers the tmz guy then you have the animal wranglers who are you know kind of the crew the backbone and there's some similar stuff in this movie i think where it's very much kind of criticizing the entertainment industry as a whole like we see how it kind of chews Mima up and spits her out at various points. You know, she tried to make it as a pop idol, then she ended up uh, moving on to acting. With both of those fields, you're having, you're dealing with a lot of exploitation, you're dealing with a lot of the fandom at large, not being able to, like, properly maintain a good relationship. You know, you, you got parasocial stuff going on. Like, you have that scene where she's cathartically stabbing the photographer who took the nude photos of her uh, which may or may not have been a dream but the guy's dead anyway we see her in that moment taking revenge for having been exploited and the rape scene of course uh, you mentioned that thing where the one actor just kind of leans in while they're moving cameras and uh, he, he goes I'm so sorry and she's like no it's okay and in that lecture series that I was talking about Cone said that like in that moment she's doing Doing this out of obligation and uh, him saying I'm so sorry kind of makes it worse for her because now she feels like she's putting people in this position where they're doing something they don't want to do but she has to you know be strong about it because uh, this is her job but you know what when I was watching it what I kind of interpreted that scene as is like I, I liked that the guy said I'm so sorry because in that moment he wasn't the one doing that thing to her it was the industry at large it was the directors the producers who are doing that to her and he was basically the catalyst for that moment this is just a movie that every time i watch it i appreciate it a little more like i think i watched it for the first time when i was like 20 21 i was a dumbass and totally didn't get it and then i watched it again when g kids got the license for it and they brought it to theaters so I got to see it on the big screen and that was great. I've since purchased the Blu-ray and watched it several more times since then. And I love the movie. I agree with Ethan. I think it's my favorite of Satoshi Kon's movies. If I'm looking at my favorite anime movies, like if Ghosts in the Shell is my number one, I think this is my number two. Like I updated my letterbox top four yesterday, which used to have Mind Game in it. And as much as I love Mind Game, I think it's got to be Perfect Blue. And for a, for a debut feature, just in, incredible. And the movies he went on to make after that, all extremely good, all a little more polished. But I think that the unpolishedness 
of this makes it a little better. Like, it's a little dirtier and a little uglier, and that's kind of the point. It puts you in this sort of grimy state of unease the whole time. Rehearsal より息荒くしてね。人を殺したばかりなんだからね。I also like how Cohn has basically said he didn't want to necessarily give a definitive answer to anything that's happened. Like, he has his own interpretations of what the movie's about, but he left it open enough that it's just like anybody can use their imagination to, you know, come up with whatever they want. They're just leaving it up to interpretation, which I think is really nice. And I think that that's what makes this such an interesting movie to talk about because there's so many. Things you can look at and see in so many different ways.、Um, it's just a movie that can be talked about endlessly. We won't be able to talk about it endlessly because Austin has to edit this, but we are going to be taking a quick ad break and we will be right back with some general discussion. Man, I love anime. And we're back. And now we're going to generally discuss this film. Have at it, boys. All right, so I crunched the numbers. I, I converted the JPY using,、uh, to dollars. I used an inflation calculator. This movie's budget in modern day dollars is about $660,000. Get this.、Mm. So, f- Japanese anime, right? It's like one of my Japanese animes. They、uh, do TV productions and they do feature productions, right? TV productions, you get this small f- paper. But for feature productions, you get this f- it's called Vista paper. It's f- huge, right? So Satoshi Kon, he gets the f- small paper because it's going to be an OVA. But I think he put like. Little, little masking on it, like he made it like sort of wider, like, like a change the aspect ratio of the paper somewhat. And he ordered it and had the company send it labeled as Poor Vista. So when they got it at the studio, they were like, What the f- is Poor Vista? And he's just like, Yeah. I love that, but it makes complete sense.、Uh, this movie, yeah, because it's an OVA budget. I believe it may have increased somewhat mid production, so it's not reported upon, like Otomo, because Otomo pulled some strings to try and get this pushed. And obviously, you know, Otomo had a lot of sway in the industry、uh-huh. as the guy what made Akira, well, the manga Akira. A, a whole team of guys made Akira movie. But even then, like, it's a minuscule budget for such a gorgeous looking film. It's, it, there's、yeah. such an economy of image. Truly, Satoshi Kon is like Osamu Desu. <laughs> Key, um, in this, he,、oh, follows, no. he does he does follow <laughs> that、uh, tradition, I think,、uh, somewhat. Even if his films are maybe more Blackjack or Dear Brother than they are Aim for the Ace, but nonetheless, he has that same level of being able to do a little with a lot and know where to put the extra drawings, the extra animation, and when to use stills and good layout. It's almost like he was a comics artist for. <laughs> A decade plus, and his whole job was layouts. One of the early reviews of this movie was、uh, from Roger Corman, which、uh, he, he gave it a positive review. He compared it to、uh, if Walt Disney worked with Alfred Hitchcock, which I think is basically just like buzzwords to get meat in seats. I don't even know what that means. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. No, it's not. It gets、gross. the people it, going. If I were to compare this to any director, it would easily be David Lynch. This is the lynchiest film that is not made by David Lynch. I suppose. It's populated by a bunch of weirdos. I'll give it that. Yeah.、Uh, weird looking dudes. I think I read somewhere that what differentiates this from a Hitchcock film is that her male handlers all get murdered. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> sort of flipped the Hitchcock formula. Oh,、uh, there's this.、Uh, I stumbled onto this site.、Uh, it's called Cone's Tome. And I think it's. This is odd to say because the movie's about a website that's a fake diary. But I think this may be authentic things from Satoshi Kone that he wrote around the production time. And、uh, it's interesting because there's like, I think, like 24 chapters you can read. And you can pick up very little things、um, from his day to day life that influenced the movie. There was this album called Sim City. And when he was listening to that, he got the image of simulated Mima. And、uh, also, he saw this woman, I think, on a train. And that was the woman he designed Rumi after. It was just Some woman he saw on a train. So,、yeah. if you want really intimate、uh, knowledge of what Satoshi Kone was going through, check out that website. It's in Japanese. 
Yeah, I know that he was like very much a blogger throughout his career. Like, I think his announcement that he had pancreatic cancer was through his blog. And like he was mentioning in that blog entry that like he felt guilty for like having for not being able to complete his final film. Um, and it's just like that. that's not on you, man. That's that's on God. <laughs> Oh, uh, this this movie has a couple pieces of lost media associated with it. One of them being the movie <laughs> that there's a song that plays during the uh, I think it's the film scene in the nightclub, the the film drape, where um, the, the song was from supposedly the soundtrack and never got published. No one's been able to find it in all the years since this has been released. <laughs> and also. It's kind of, it has that thing in common with Citizen Kane, where the original negative has been destroyed on accident. <laughs> so every time we want to, like, you know, do a remaster of Perfect Blue, you're using some kind of, uh, you know, duplicated print of lesser quality. I think the sheet order for this film, I think it was either 20,000 or 30,000 sheets, which is nice, because I think an episode of TV is like 5,000 sheets. And, and, you know, Princess Mononoke is 150,000 sheets, but they, they had uh, enough sheets to work with. I completely agree. I feel like it's a film that doesn't really rely so much on its animation illustrations. Like, um, for reference, like, Naushika uses uh, probably just, just over 6,000 more than Perfect Blue, um, you know, at an extra half an hour in length. I it used by far um, the lowest number of animation drawings of any uh, Studio Ghibli film. Your layouts can carry a lot, um, or if you use good looping animation. Um, speaking of the animation, though, there are some really effective sequences, particularly when Mima's rushing through the hallway. There's some great like uh, animation of her perspective, her point of view, where she's running through the hallway and the hallway is animated around her and you see all the people sort of flying out of the way and the detritus. That's a great sort of money moment um, and you see a lot, there's a lot of good like animation of reflections of people throughout very much uh, through through a looking glass darkly uh, sort of thing that seems to be part of the central theming of this film that's really cool so it was Satoshi Kone early on he had to design Mima's room and apparently he didn't have a lot of girlfriends or something because he had to reference uh, photography books to figure out what a young woman's room would look like and you can you can actually buy some of the photography books that were the inspiration for Mima's room in this movie. I think one is called Yellow Privacy, 1994. Let's list them here. Extremely re relatable. Just I don't know what a girl's room looks like. Yeah, like you were saying earlier, though, like it's such a surprisingly evergreen message of internet culture like it was such a young concept back then and they had no idea how <sighs> accurate that would still be 25 years later just weirdos making blogs on the internet being creepy towards uh, celebrities I think what's so incredible about this movie is that despite it being so centrally about big dumb nerds on like Usenet forums and weirdos making GeoCities sites dedicated to their, their favorite idols, it doesn't feel like an a quote unquote internet movie. Like it hasn't been so instantly dated as stuff like hackers or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Or like, like even, you know, Ghost in the Shell and that sort of thing where, where technology is so central to it. They also feel like such a relic of a time because it's speculative fiction written in that period. But since it's so contemporary, it feels central to the larger narrative while never like detracting from it. Like never detracting from the sense that it, this is just sort of an evergreen thriller, uh, an, ever, an evergreen yeah. psychological thriller more than anything. Yeah, I think that like this and um, Serial Experiments Lane, they both like really nailed it on that aspect of getting kind of net culture just right. And I think it's because they kept it in their present day, present time, ha 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 ha. But it still works so well today. And like I alluded to earlier, like this movie is, it's very commonly seen as like a companion piece to Millennium Actress which I think is definitely accurate. Like there's sort of like two sides of the same coin where one is showing like sort of the darker elements of the entertainment industry and the other one's sort of a love letter to cinema. It's kind of like the Otaku no Video OVA where it has like the actual OVA and then has these little mockumentary segments called Portrait of an Otaku where it's like on one hand you're showing like the camaraderie of these guys who became friends because of their interests. And then on the other side, it's just like the people who got way too absorbed in said interests. So, you know, just kind of the two sides of the same coin. Uh, and I think it's interesting to kind of look at both sides and that kind of thing. Like, I think 
Millennium Actress was just a perfect movie to come out right after this because you got this one showing all of the dark things about the film industry and of celebrity worship. And then Millennium Actress is just such a nice little palate cleanser of showing how good film can be just artistically and uh, like how it brings crews together and stuff like that. Cone nailed it with the double feature on that one. Also, that's just like a classic move for people breaking onto the film scene is to do a film about intensity where intensity is the selling point and then try to convince people that you can do these like heartfelt films. What makes them cry? You know, these uh, like like Darren Aronofsky is a funny example of this because he came out of the gate with Pie and Requiem for a Dream, two movies about their intensity. And then he kept trying to make his sincere movie. He was like, here, do you like The Fountain? No. Uh, do you like The Wrestler? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like Black Swan? <laughs> it's kind of he was he was trying to pull that flip off yeah. uh, for for a while. You think I'm a failure? I know who I am, and I'm proud of what I do. It was a conscious choice. I didn't f up. Again, referencing that uh, lecture series, like they were talking about how the opening scene is that like Sentai show. Like he was kind of talking about how it kind of ties into the theming of the movie. With they were basically. F the RGB or whatever they were fighting to protect the net from uh, this bug who was attacking and it's sort of like analogous of her versus this bug version of herself but it's also just kind of funny because it's like people because back, back when they were first starting this again it was supposed to be an OVA and it was just going to be on video store shelves where people are just like trying to look for like Genocyber or whatever Vampire Hunter D kind of thing that they can find. So we just thought it would be very funny if uh, somebody ran a perfect blue, saw it on that shelf with those movies and then turned it on and it was suddenly just Power Rangers and they're just like, did I pick up the wrong movie? <laughs> I think what's particularly <laughs> funny about that too is the same year, the Sentai that was airing on television was uh, Denji Sentai Mega Ranger, which was, uh, it had fairly similar designs sort of crossed with the, the previous year's Sentai team, but also it was a Sentai specifically themed around uh, video games and cyberspace, you know, particularly relevant to this film, the cyberspace element of it, which A, would have confused people uh, at the time because they've been like is this a tie into that Sentai that's on TV <laughs> right now or more to the point like you know the larger thematic core it kind of hints at it even in such a silly way uh, which I think is cute and I like to imagine was intentional and not just me reading into it too much now now that we're done with the uh, general discussion let's uh, go into some final thoughts we'll start with Ethan uh, I love this film. I think it's uh, incredibly prescient. I think it holds up to the test of time by and large. It's an intense sort of psychological thriller, but it's incredibly distinct uh, and singular in the canon of anime features, animated features, features in general, really. You'll be hard pressed to find someone as incredible as Satoshi Kon, and I'm glad I got to talk about it with you guys, as always. Absolutely. Awesome. Final thoughts. It seems like the things that make this movie terrifying have either persisted or evolved since its release. So until we as a society figure out how to fix this shit, Perfect Blue is always gonna hit. Nice. Yeah, again, I love this movie. Um, it's one of my favorite anime films ever. It's one of my favorite films ever. You can always find more and more to appreciate about it. And if you haven't watched it, obviously, I would recommend looking into content warnings if uh, our discussion hasn't properly warned you. But if you're able to kind of get through that kind of stuff, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It recently dropped on Shudder, so you can stream it there. I would, yeah, again, definitely recommend checking it out. So that is going to do it for this podcast. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. If you are listening on any of the audio platforms, give us a review or a five stars or a thumbs up or whatever you think we deserve, uh, you know. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. Uh, leave a comment below and let us know. What do you think of Satoshi Kon's work? What do you think of Perfect Blue? What do you think of cinema? Let us know. Did you have a GeoCity <laughs> Shrine site? While you're down there, uh, <laughs> give us a like if you like the video. Give us a subscribe if you'd like to see more of our videos. And uh, hit the bell icon so you can know when we upload those videos. 
check out our Patreon where you can uh, give us money. Uh, and then if you give us money, we'll, we'll put your name in the end cards, maybe. You can also check us out on Spotify Video where our swear words are uncensored, you f***. That's gonna do it for our final episode of the Bomb Squad podcast. Yeah, anybody have any final words for the podcast? It's been a fun ride doing this podcast that is totally just a podcast and is not misleading with how it's named. I had a great time working on this thing that's totally a podcast. Absolutely. E Ethan, you got anything? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hell yeah. Thank you for tuning in for these 85 episodes. Uh, and uh, please tune in next week uh, so that you can get a sneak peek of what we have in store for you next. But until then... Remember, celebrity worship culture is bad. Go touch some grass or something. Farewell. Please. Sayonara, the Bomb Squad podcast. I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl. <laughs>